Hi, I'm Ken Sandberg. And I'm Heather Michelle Lawler. Welcome to Campfire Classics, where we try to read those books that look really good on your shelf. It's December, and it's beginning to look a lot like holiday time. To his jam. <laughs> oh, yeah. Why are you in such a good mood? I have lots of reasons for being in a good mood. <laughs> but one of them is because you said yes. Yeah. So, uh, hello, everybody. We're engaged as of Ta-da. last night. Or so when this comes out, like three nights ago. As of Saturday, November 28th. Yeah. So at, a, at around 10 52 or yeah, so. Yeah. He liked it, so he put a ring on it. <laughs> That's After we had delicious food at the Venom, uh, our favorite restaurant, and uh, we're walking home by the Hudson River, and he was being all cute, and we were listening to Billy Joel on my phone, and uh, we were dancing, and then he stopped, and he was like, hey, you want to be my best friend forever? And I said, yes. <laughs> I don't think I put on quite that <laughs> schmoopy a voice. No, you did not. <laughs> al- although I'm sure it was pretty schmoopy. It was pretty great. So, yeah. So you, the co-hosts of Campfire Classics are now engaged. So betrothed for you traditionalists. Betrothed. <laughs> yeah, it's a good word. I, I like I like betrothed. Um, promised. You are my intended. Yes, uh, I will give you my dowry. <laughs> Ooh, is there a dowry? No. Oh. Mom, Dad, we have no dowry, right? I guess the dowry is we get to stay at their house when we're homeless. That's because we're also uh, leaving uh, New York yeah. this week. <laughs> yeah, for the last few months we've been living in Staten Island in our apartment where we have been paying rent for the last few years, but n- only living here very intermittently for the last year or so. Yeah. Uh, and we finally decided it's not worth the crazy high rents and we're going to, um, while it may horrify you to learn this, um, podcasting is not the most lucrative of career choices. No. So this just, it's <laughs> not, it's not bringing in quite enough money for us to pay our bills. For sure. <laughs> Though we would love for it too. So tell your friends about Campfire Classics. Um, because if we can get like a thousand ep- d- downloads an episode, we might get some sponsors. And that'd be cool. And we're way far away from that. So d- do do your do your dutiful duty to the new couple, the newly engaged couple, and share this with a friend. Yeah, and help us out a lot. Yeah, and uh, just a reminder that if we get to a thousand patrons on Patreon, oh, yeah. uh, I have a tattoo that I'll be getting. So that's yeah. We're, I think we're solidly but, at like seven or eight. But but <laughs> for now, I'll, I'll settle for a thousand people who listen to the podcast. Yeah, you don't even have to give any money. Yeah. Hell, I'll settle for a hundred who regularly listen to the podcast. Yeah. That'd be great. That'd be really cool. We could get like a hundred downloads like a day or something. Yeah. Sweet. Uh, other big changes yes. in the life of Campfire Classics. You may notice that we sound extra sexy in we're this so new episode. Sexy. <laughs> um, that's because we're uh, we're working with some new recording technology. Yeah. Uh, thanks to our amazing patrons, we were able to afford an upgrade on our microphone technology. We've been using the Yeti Blue thus far. Which was uh, fine, but it was one mic and it picked up a lot of ambient sounds around our apartment and or ever, wherever we've been recording. We've come to you for many places. But uh, we, yeah, we recently, we invested in an upgrade. We've got a couple of Shure mics now and, uh, uh, well, so far I think they sound great. Yeah, they're pretty fun. And we're like, we're on two separate microphones. So it's like, we're just, we're actually sitting on our couch and not on our bed because we don't have to like surround the other microphone and try and drown out as much sound. Yeah. Editing this episode is either going to be way easier or (laughs) way harder. But yeah, so we sound sexy. We're newly engaged and it's the holiday season. Uh, it's officially December as of when this comes out. And uh, 
welcome to the the, the Christmas uh, Hanukkah holiday um, presents and Santa and the solstice season. The solstice season. Ooh, I like this. It's the solstice season. <laughs> we're we're creeping ever closer to the um, the longest darkest night of the year. Which is why there are so many celebrations this time of year, because people are trying to celebrate to beat back the horror of darkness. Yes. Which is kind of a depressing way to look at it, but that's where it all comes from. Uh, Speaking (laughs) of beating back the door of darkness. Oh, Lord. (laughs) You want to know what you're reading? Um, I did. (laughs) That seemed like a good segue, because you're reading a ghost story. Great. What am I reading? You will be reading uh, The Room in the Tower by E.F. Benson. So new writer for us. New writer, all right. New writer for us. And uh, yeah, it, I mean, he's it's a ghost story and it's about a tower, dark room. So that just seemed, seems like a good segue. <laughs> no, totally. I'm on board. I love creepy stories. Let's do it. Let's do it. So I'm going to give you some fun facts since we have a brand new writer. Um his name, E.F. Benson was his pen name, but his name is Edward Frederick Benson. Uh, and he is an English novelist from England, of course. Uh, he was also... As a, most English novelists are. I mean, I guess English as an American, like, he's not American. <laughs> he's an English language novelist. Yes. <laughs> Born and raised in not Merca. Not, not Merca. Um, he was also a biographer and an archaeologist. So Sweet. Cool. Um, so he bridged the gap between Agatha Christie and her husband. Yeah. He's like, well, watch. Let me drop my mic, even though he predates them. So he was born uh, July 24th, 1867. And um, he was born at Wellington College in Berkshire and is the fifth child of the headmaster of that school, uh, Edward White Benson. And his mom was Mary Sedgwick, or Minnie, as she went by. Um, So this is a very successful family. Uh, I guess having a headmaster as a dad who went on to be like the Archbishop of Canterbury. Oh, Jesus. I know. Um, I thought he was a Shakespeare character. Yeah, so did I. The Archbishop of Canterbury. Canterbury. Sounds like he's up to something. Probably. Probably. EF, he had a, a younger brother, Arthur Christopher Benson, and he wrote the words to Land of Hope and Glory, which is like a, um, a church song. A hymn. A hymn. Um, his other brother, Robert Hugh Benson, uh, was the author of several novels and Roman Catholic works. So he worked for the church. And their, his sister, Maggie Benson, or Margaret, was the author was an author and an amateur Egyptologist. <laughs> Sweet. It's cool as hell. (laughs) It's like, this family's rocking it. Um, He went to Temple Grove School and Marlboro College, and then he continued his education at King's College, Cambridge, um, where he was a member of the Pitt Club, uh, whatever that means. I'm assuming they went rowing and, you know. No, I think that uh, that was uh, at Cambridge. The Pitt Club was a predecessor of the movie Fight Club. Oh, they just beat the shit out they of each other, but they didn't talk and, about it. Yeah. Okay. okay. They, which is why you don't know what the pit club is, because the first rule is you don't talk about pit club. Okay. I, t- I should have known. I mean, <laughs> 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 damn it, Wikipedia. Um, so Benson was writing like when he was at Marlboro, actually, before he went to Cambridge. So his first book was published, uh, and it was called Sketches from Marlboro. Um, and this started his novel writing career. Uh, his first like f- his first big novel was called Dodo and it came out in 1893 that was an instant success and uh, it was like a variety of satire and romantic and supernatural melodrama is how it is described all right I went what um, and he repeated the success of this book with um, uh uh, Dodo the Second, which came out in 1914, so quite a while later. Um, one of the things in this original novel that he wrote, he said he repeated, uh, it featured a scathing description of composer and militant suffragette Ethel Smith, which she gleefully acknowledged. <laughs> she loved it. Um, <laughs> she's she's like, like, yeah, bring it on. 
Yeah, bring it, I bitch. I like it. Hit me with your best shot. Um, And he continued that later. And then uh, he also... Um, so he wrote a lot of novels. He wrote uh, biographies um, as well. But he was also known as a writer of atmospheric and at times humorous or satirical ghost stories. So uh, these is this, a, is this a funny ghost story? I don't know. I'm very Ooh. excited. Um, uh, it was first pub- first published in magazines, and in 1906, the short story "The Bus Conductor." is about a fatal crash premonition and it's a tale about a person haunted by a hearse driver it has, has been adapted into the several, movie final destination uh that's what i thought i was like <laughs> that sounds like final destination but the ones that were noted were in 1944 there was a movie dead of the night um or dead of night and in 1961 it was an episode of the twilight zone based on that so uh, of course it was that's fun um, there's a catchphrase from that um, that was became kind of legendary, and it's called uh, the catchphrase is the hearse driver says, "Room for one more, room for one more." <laughs> like, oh hell no! Yeah, yeah, that uh-uh. seems creepy. No, thank you. <laughs> it's like get in my hearse. There's room for one more. What the fuck? Um, so a little bit more about him as a person. E. F. Benson was a homosexual, but he was very discreet about it. <laughs> As most people were at the time. Had to be. Had to be, unfortunately. Uh, At Cambridge, he fell in love with several of his fellow students, including Vincent York, who is um, uh, the father of the eventual novelist Henry York. So, um, and he wrote in his diary, and there's a, (laughs) from his diary, uh, it said, I feel perfectly mad about him just now. Uh, if only he knew, and yet I think he does. Duh. I was like, that is such a diary entry. It's like, I got a crush on someone. <laughs> um, I have a crush on every boy. I like all the boys. I wish they only knew, but I think they do. Um in later life, uh, Benson sustained friendships with a wide circle of gay men and actually shared a villa at Capri with John Ellington Brooks or Ellingham Brooks. Um, prior to, so this is a, this used to be the Fire Island of the time. So it was <laughs> pri- <laughs> prior to the First World War, the island was popular with wealthy homosexuals. <laughs> So this isle, this this villa on the Isle of Capri, it's rich British Fire rich Island, rich British Fire Island. <laughs> it's it's where all the all the gays went and were like, we can be gay here, we can be fabulous and not care. So I'm glad they had that um, <laughs> rich rich British Fire Island. Uh, homoeroticism was a huge like reoccurring theme in his stories which um were also famed for wry and dry campy humor so great sounds about right um, so this is if oscar wilde were predominantly a horror writer yeah yeah basically great Love i it. wonder if they were friends fun fact last fun fact which is amazing benson was also an athlete and represented england in figure skating <laughs> hell yeah <laughs> Right? All right, dude. <laughs> so, he, and like Johnny Weir would be proud. <laughs> it's like, I wonder if he used that <laughs> as his like artistic expression until he could do it in writing. Um, but yes, the, uh, the story you will be reading today is called The Room in the Tower, which is also the title of a collection of short ghost stories. Um, so it's the first story in this collection and it's the title and that was published in 1912. Excellent. So I don't know anything about it except it was suggested to us by one of, uh, the groups, um, one of our favorite, uh, Facebook thinking horror, uh, Alia Ahmad, who's actually suggested quite a few of our stories. She's recommended a few of the ones we've already read and we have a few more on that list from her. She's, she's kicking butt um, knocking it out of the park for yeah, us thank so you thank very much you, Alia. um and i don't know ef benson and neither does ken and we're gonna give it a shot nah, this so will be fun want to light some fire let's start this fire the room in the tower by ef benson 
it is probable that everybody who is at all a constant dreamer has had at least one experience of an event or a sequence of circumstances which have come to his mind in sleep being subsequently realized in the material world. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. Good opener. Yeah. But, in my opinion, so far from this being a strange thing, it would be far odder if this fulfillment did not occasionally happen since our dreams are, as a rule, concerned with people whom we know and places with which we are familiar, such as might very naturally occur in the awake and daylit world. True. These dreams are often broken into by some absurd and fantastic incident which puts them out of court in regard to their subsequent fulfillment, but on the mere calculation of chances, it does not appear in the least unlikely that a dream imagined by anyone who dreams constantly should occasionally come true. Not long ago, for instance, I experienced such a fulfillment of a dream which seems to me in no way remarkable and to have no kind of physical significance. The manner of it was as follows. Okay. So dreamers got a dream and like it's likely that you will have like deja vu type experiences like at least because like some yeah, people well, think that's what deja vu is is you've had a dream, had a dream and then you it. live that dream. Um yeah, so I have really weird fucking dreams, though. Like, some of my dreams, some of my dreams could come true. Like, I have a lot of, like, rehearsal dreams and, the, like, that kind of, perform like, actor dreams. But for the most part, they're so weird that I would be very unsettled if they happened in I'd, real life. I would be super concerned if I ever forgot all of my lines at rehearsal at which I was naked and suddenly growing horns out of my back. Yeah, that would be upsetting. Like that would be, that'd be a bad... I, I think that would be a sign of the apocalypse. Of something really, really wrong. <laughs> really unsettling. Yeah. I have reoccurring tornado dreams, and I have actually never seen a tornado um, since I was a kid. Uh, but they're usually really, fu like, fucking scary. And I often get to, like, see in the tornado. Like, I'll look up and, like, much like in Twister, <laughs> Helen Hunt wanted to see inside the tornado. Yeah. My two most common recurring dreams, which um, I haven't had many recurring dreams as an adult, mm -hmm. like full grown adult. But as a kid, my two most common recurring dreams, uh, one of them, I was having a picnic on a hilltop with my family and the hilltop became surrounded by a dense fog and then a giant tentacle like <laughs> caterpillar. Like the fuzzy brown and black yeah. caterpillars, but long and skinny like a tentacle started reaching up and dragging people down into the fog. No. Yeah. No, so that no, was, no. So that was one of them. No. And then the other recurring dream was uh, about me and Craig, my brother again, playing tag up on top of a cliff. And he reached out to tag <gasps> me and I fell off. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. But... I ended up doing the thing that happens in cartoons all the time where like I was falling off, but I grabbed onto a branch and I was okay. And then the branch broke and I was falling, falling, falling. And then I like landed on my crotch on a flagpole that was sticking out and I was okay, but it hurt. But then I spun around the flagpole and fell off. And then I hit like an awning that was oh sticking God. out of the cliff. But then I ripped through the awning. And then every time I would have this dream, like I'd go through a bunch of those things. And just as I was about to slam into the spikes at the bottom of the cliff, I found myself back at the top of the cliff. <gasps> Oh, what the hell does that mean? I don't know. Childhood recurring dreams. Oh, my God. Okay. Well, I'm glad that hasn't happened to you <laughs> in reality. That, that would be a very strange dream to end up coming true in the, what was it? In the awake and daylit world. Yeah. Well, be careful on tops of cliffs, I guess, for you. Yeah. <laughs> A certain friend of mine, living abroad, is amiable enough to write to me about once in a fortnight. 
Thus, when 14 days or thereabouts have elapsed since I heard from him, my mind, probably either consciously or subconsciously, is expectant of a letter from him. One night last week, I dreamed that I was going upstairs to dress for dinner. I heard, as I often heard, the sound of the postman's knock on my front door and diverted my direction downstairs instead. There, among other correspondence, was a letter from him. Thereafter, the fantastic entered, for on opening it, I found inside the Ace of Diamonds and scribbled across it in his well-known handwriting, I am sending you this for safe custody. As you know, it is running an unreasonable risk to keep aces in Italy. The fuck? (laughs) The next evening, I was just preparing to go upstairs to dress when I heard the postman's knock and did precisely as I had done in my dream. There, among other letters, was one from my friend, only it did not contain the Ace of Diamonds. Had it done so, I should have attached more weight to the matter, which, as it stands, seems to me a perfectly ordinary coincidence. No doubt, I consciously or subconsciously expected a letter from him, and this suggested to me my dream. Similarly, the fact that my friend had not written to me for a fortnight suggested to him that he should do so. But occasionally, it is not so easy to find such an explanation— And for the following story, I can find no explanation at all. It came out of the dark, and into the dark, it has gone again. Darkness. See, I did the segue (laughs) just perfectly, and I had no idea what was coming. But I was like, speaking of darkness. It was like you knew. Oh, oh, creepy. Ew. (laughs) I had creepy premonition about the story. Uh. (laughs) Oh, that's upsetting. Ugh, I just got the chills. And that's not just because it's cold here. No. <laughs> All my life I have been a habitual dreamer. The nights are few, that is to say, when I do not find on awaking in the morning that some mental experience has been mine. And sometimes, all night long, apparently, a series of the most dazzling adventures befall me. Almost without exception, these adventures are pleasant, though often merely trivial. It is of an exception that I am going to speak. It was when I was about 16 that a certain dream first came to me, and this is how it befell. It was sexy. And I woke up with a mess in my sheets. (laughs) And this is how it befell. It opened with my being set down at the door of a big red brick house where I understood I was going to stay. The servant who opened the door told me that tea was being served in the garden and led me through a low, dark paneled hall with a large open fireplace onto a cheerful green lawn set round with flower beds. There were grouped about the tea table a small party of people. But they were all strangers to me except one who was a schoolfellow called Jack Stone, clearly the son of the house, and he introduced me to his mother and father and a couple of sisters. I was, I remember, somewhat astonished to find myself here, for the boy in question was scarcely known to me, and I rather disliked what I knew of him. Oh. Moreover, So they're going to fall in love. Probably, yeah. That's how these stories always go. Always. Even in dreams. Yep. Moreover, he had left school nearly a year before. The afternoon was very hot and an intolerable oppression reigned. On the far side of the lawn ran a red brick wall with an iron gate in its center, outside which stood a walnut tree. We sat in the shadow of the house opposite a row of long windows, inside which I could see a table with cloth laid, glimmering with glass and silver. This garden front of the house was very long, and at one end of it stood a tower of three stories, which looked to me much older than the rest of the building. Okay. Before long, Mrs. Stone, who, like the rest of the party, had sat in absolute silence, said to me, "'Jack will show you to your room.' 
I have given you the room in the tower. <laughs> um, no, I'm good. Um, um, can I just like hang out here? <laughs> um, did you did you plan that thunderclap or was that <laughs> like oh, um the room in the tower? I've seen Beauty and the Beast. You're gonna lock me up. Wait a second. That's the title of this story. I think something bad's Something's gonna happen. Up. Yeah. <laughs> I saw the title of my dream, and now you... No, I don't like this. I don't like it at all. Mm -mm. I have given you the room room in the tower. tower. Quite inexplicably, my heart sank at her words. That's not so inexplicable. No, it's not. If someone told me they gave me the room in the tower, I don't care if it was like... I don't care if it's a modern house. The room in the tower just sounds creepy. Sounds... That's an unsettling It's like, why why do you have a tower? (laughs) First of all... Why is there a tower? Um, second of all, why is that the guest room? Like, that seems just not accessible, super accessible. <laughs> I don't know. Gross. Continue on. Quite inexplicably, my heart sank at her words. I felt as if I had known that I should have the room in the tower and that it contained something dreadful and significant. Jack instantly got up and I understood that I had to follow him. In silence, we passed through the hall and mounted a great oak staircase with many corners and arrived at a small landing with two doors set in it. He pushed one of these open for me to enter and without coming in himself, closed it Uh, after me. Oh, hell no. He just got damn locked in that tower. Then I knew that my conjecture had been right. There was something awful in the room. And with the terror of nightmare growing swiftly and enveloping me, I awoke in a spasm of terror. Oh, God. Ugh. Yuck. Now, that dream, or variations on it, occurred to me intermittently for 15 years. Ooh. Most often, it came in exactly this form. The arrival, the tea laid out on the lawn, the deadly silence succeeded by that one deadly sentence. The mounting with Jack Stone up to the room in the tower where horror dwelt, and it always came to a close in the nightmare of terror at that which was in the room, though I never saw what it was. Ew, that's gross. (laughs) Ew. Now it's your time to play along. Let us know what you have recurring dreams about. Yeah. Just because I think recurring dreams are super cool. They're really cool. They're really creepy, too. Um, So, you just said that ordinarily, the dream runs exactly like that. At other times, I experienced variations on this same theme. Occasionally, for instance, we would be sitting at dinner in the dining room, into the windows of which I had looked on the first night when the dream of this house visited me. But wherever we were, there was the same silence the same sense of dreadful oppression and foreboding. And the silence I knew would always be broken by Mrs. Stone saying to me, Jack, we'll show you up to your room. I have given you the The room room in in the the tower. tower. Upon which this was invariable, I had to follow him up the oak staircase with many corners and enter the place that I dreaded more and more each time that I visited it in sleep. Mm. Or, again, I would find myself playing cards still in silence in the drawing room lit with immense chandeliers that gave a blinding illumination. What the game was, I have no idea. What I remember, with a sense of miserable anticipation, was that soon Mrs. Stone would get up and say to me, Jack, we'll show you to your room. I have given you the The room room in the the tower. tower. (laughs) This drawing room where we played cards was next to the dining room and, as I have said, was always brilliantly illuminated, whereas the rest of the house was full of dusk and shadows. And yet, how often, in spite of those bouquets of lights, have I not poured over the cards that were dealt me, scarcely able for some reason to see them? Their designs, too, were strange. There were no red suits, but all were black, and among them were certain cards that were black all over. 
I hated and dreaded those. Ew. Ew. It's like demon, demon cards. This is spooky. Yeah. You really did pick a good story to get us into the holiday spirit. <laughs> hey, hey. Christmas Carol's a ghost story. I'm it just is. saying. <laughs> We're, well, this is this is preparation for the the oncoming night. Yes. <laughs> and maybe he's going to get visited by three ghosts up in that tower. <laughs> As this dream continued to recur, I got to know the greater part of the house. There was a smoking room beyond the drawing room at the end of the passage with a green baize door. Baize. Baez. Baez door. How do you with spell the green it? B-A-I-Z-E. Noun, a coarse, typically green woolen material resembling felt, used for covering billiard and card tables. Huh. There was a smoking room beyond the drawing room at the end of the passage with a green felted door. Uh, I could, yeah, I've seen something like, like okay. in like game rooms and parlor rooms, like, yeah. It was always very dark there, and as often as I went there, I passed somebody who I could not see in the doorway coming out. Curious developments, too, took place in the characters that peopled the dream as might happen to living persons. Mrs. Stone, for instance, who when I first saw her had been black-haired, became gray, and instead of rising briskly, as she had done at first when she said, Jack will show you to your room. I have given you the, the room, room in, in the, the tower. tower. <laughs> Got up very feebly, as if the strength was leaving her limbs. Jack also grew up and became a rather ill-looking man with a brown mustache, <laughs> while one of the sisters ceased to appear. Ew. And I understood she was married. Oh, okay. Then it so happened that I was not visited by this dream for six months or more, and I began to hope in such inexplicable dread did I hold it that it had passed away for good. But one night after this interval, I again found myself being shown out onto the lawn for tea, and Mrs. Stone was not there Uh oh. while the others were all dressed in black at once i guessed the reason and my heart leaped at the thought that perhaps this time i should not have to sleep in the room in the tower <laughs> and though we usually all sat in silence on this occasion uh, the sense of relief made me talk and laugh as i had never yet done but even then, matters were not altogether comfortable, for no one else spoke, but they all looked secretly at each other. Ew. And soon the foolish stream of my talk ran dry, and gradually an apprehension worse than anything I had previously known gained on me as the light slowly faded. Suddenly... A voice which I knew well broke the stillness. The voice of Mrs. Stone <gasps> saying, Jack will show you to your room. I have given you the room, the room in the, the town. Where is she? It seemed to come from near the gate in the red brick wall that bounded the lawn. And looking up, I saw that the grass outside was sown thick with gravestones. A curious grayish light shone from them, and I could read the lettering on the grave nearest me. And it was, In Evil Memory of Julia Stone. In Evil Memory? That is not what you want on your gravestone. That's, that's a far cry from rest in peace. Yeah, that is... <laughs> Julia Stone. <laughs> Actually, you know what? Put me down for that inscription. <laughs> <laughs> In evil memory. That sounds cool. Well, because like, people would totally like that would be one of the gravestones like the kids would go to and like be like, there's a like a yeah, witch that like, buried here. Like, don't get me wrong, I'm not looking forward to having a gravestone or anything, no. but if I have to have a gravestone, I would love it to be a tourist destination. Yeah, like something weird as fuck. <laughs> like 
if it could, it could say something really creepy or something really funny or something, yeah, like, yeah. yeah. I would love to have, um, like an entire Buffy the Vampire Slayer esque drama <laughs> action series written based around the mystery of the inscription on my grave, you know, like. May he finally rest in peace after all the decades of torture and like, or something like. I'm trying to think of if you were like a vampire. Still not resting. Ew. <laughs> in evil memory of Julia Stone. And as usual, Jack got up, and uh, again, I followed him through the hall and up the staircase with many corners. On this occasion, it was darker than usual, and when I passed into the room in the tower, I could only just see the furniture, the position of which was already familiar to me. Also, there was a dreadful odor of decay in the room. Oh, gross. And I woke screaming. Uh. (laughs) The dream, with such variations and developments as I have mentioned, went on at intervals for 15 years. Sometimes I would dream it two or three nights in succession. Once, as I have said, there was an intermission of six months, but taking a reasonable average, I should say that I dreamed it quite as often as once in a month. It had, as is plain, something of nightmare about it. You think? Since it always (laughs) ended in the same appalling terror, which, so far from getting less, seemed to me to gather fresh fear every time that I experienced it. There was, too, a strange and dreadful consistency about it. The characters in it, as I have mentioned, got regularly older. Death and marriage visited this silent family, and I never, in the dream after Mrs. Stone had died, set eyes on her again. But it was always her voice that told me that the room in the tower was prepared for me. And whether we had tea out on the lawn or the scene was laid in one of the rooms overlooking it, I could always see her gravestone standing just outside the iron gate. That's really creepy that they aged. Like, that, like, they're like a real, like, as he grew up, they grew up. Because, like, that is one thing in dreams that, like, tends to like they like they don't people don't tend to age like or like grow like normal people and the fact that she's like not only have people aged but people have gotten married and like died and like it's really creepy well if the conceit of this is that this dream in some fashion is going to come true yeah it's because he's following the actions of the actual real life family even though he doesn't know them even though he doesn't point. know them yet yeah he's still going through and like he's gonna end up bumping into jack and being invited to his place uh and- if i actually ran into a guy named jack stone i would a part of me would be like okay let's do this let's finally see what the fuck's in there <laughs> i also might just kick him in the face and run <laughs> Because that's creep. Like, oh, my God, if you've been having this dream for 15 years and all of a sudden that that person walks in and it's like your nightmare. Oh, my God. Yep, like, that's fair. Yes, Just sort be of a hell morbid, no, dude, I'm out. There'd be a morbid curiosity of, yeah, I'm going to follow this because there's clearly a reason. But also there'd be like genuine terror. <laughs> I could always see her gravestone standing just outside the iron gate. It was the same, too, with the married daughter. Usually, she was not present, but once or twice she returned again in company with a man whom I took to be her husband. He, too, like the rest of them, was always silent. But, owing to the constant repetition of the dream, I had ceased to attach in my waking hours any significance to it. I never met Jack Stone again during all those years, nor did I ever see a house that resembled this dark house of my dream. And then, something happened. No! No! (laughs) Oh, God! Well, of course something was going to happen. It'd be a pretty boring story if something didn't happen. (laughs) If he's like, but I went on and life continued, and uh, thank you for listening to my story. (laughs) 
Yeah, no, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> that's the end of the story. <laughs> Bye. I had been in London in this year up till the end of the July and during the first week in August went down to stay with a friend in a house he had taken for the summer months in the Ashdown Forest District of Sussex. I left Ah, Sussex in the July. (laughs) I left London early for John Clinton was to meet me at Forest Row Station and we were going to spend the day golfing and go to his house in the evening. He had his motor with him, and we set off about five of the afternoon after a thoroughly delightful day for the drive, the distance being some ten miles. As it was still so early, we did not have tea at the clubhouse, but waited till we should get home. As we drove, the weather, which up till then had been, though hot, deliciously fresh, seemed to me to alter in quality and become very stagnant and oppressive, and I felt that indefinable sense of ominous apprehension that I am accustomed to before thunder. John, however, did not share my views, attributing my loss of lightness to the fact that I had lost both my matches. <laughs> He's like, no, nah, life's good. No, life's I good. I just you're kicked just a, your ass. You're just a sore loser. You're just a terrible golfer, man. <laughs> Suck it up, princess. <laughs> Events proved, however, that I was right though I do not think that the thunderstorm that broke that night was the sole cause of my depression. Ooh, there was actually a thunderstorm. Our way lay through deep, high-banked lanes, and before we had gone very far, I fell asleep and was only awakened by the stopping of the motor. And with a sudden thrill, partly of fear but chiefly of curiosity, I found myself standing in the doorway of my house of dream. No, worst Airbnb ever. (laughs) Oh, God. His friend's like, I got this cool house. It's like Cabin in the Woods shit. It's like, my cousin has this house. You want to go check it out? His name's definitely not Jack Stone. (laughs) I wanted to go stay in the house of my dreams. I didn't realize. (laughs) It was the house of my nightmares. It was the house of that dream. (laughs) He lost at golf, and he's got to go to this house in the same day? That's a rough day. Yeah. (laughs) We went, I half wondering whether or not I was dreaming still, through a low oak-paneled hall and out onto the lawn where tea was laid in the shadow of the house. It was set in flower beds, a red brick wall with a gate in it, bounded one side, and out beyond that was a space of rough grass with a walnut tree. The facade of the house was very long, and at one end stood a three-storied tower, no. markedly older than the rest. No. Here, for the moment, all resemblance to the repeated dream ceased. Okay, well, that's good. There was no silent and somehow terrible family, but a large assembly of exceedingly cheerful persons, all of whom were known to me. And in spite of the horror which the dream itself had always filled me, I felt nothing of it now that the scene of it was thus reproduced before me. But I felt intensest curiosity as to what was going to happen. Tea pursued its cheerful course, and before long, Mrs. Clinton got up. And at that moment, I think I knew what she was going to say. She spoke to me, and what she said was, Jack will show you to your room. I have given you the room in the tower. Oh, fuck no. No, no, no. Who's Jack? At that, for half a second... The horror of the dream took hold of me again, but it quickly passed, and again I felt nothing more than the most intense curiosity. It was not very long before it was amply satisfied. John turned to me. Jack is... John is Jack. It's a, a, like... Jack is a a, a, a famous domesticity for John. Especially in England. Like, they like to do that. Yep. Very Oscar Wilde as well. Yeah. Famous domesticity for John. Yeah. Jack. 
uh, that play. The uh, importance of being earnest. Of being earnest. <laughs> earnest. Um, John turned to me. Uh, right up at the top of the house, he said. But I think you'll be comfortable. We're absolutely full. Would you like to go and see it now? By Jove, I believe that you are right and that we are going to have a thunderstorm. Oh, How God. dark it has become. Oh, and you had you had totally like predicted there was going to be a thunderstorm because <laughs> when you said, when we first read The Room in the Tower, you're like, did, did that thunder? Did you plant that thunderclap? Oh, my God. <laughs> we're, oh, ew, ew, ew. Maybe we both had this dream <laughs> that we were going to read this story. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Okay. I'm creeped out. Go. <laughs> I got up and followed him. We passed through the hall and up the perfectly familiar staircase. Then he opened the door, and I went in, and at that moment, sheer, unreasoning terror again possessed me. I did not know what I feared, I simply feared. Then, like a sudden recollection when one remembers a name which has long escaped the memory, I knew what I feared. I feared Mrs. Stone whose grave with the sinister inscription in evil memory I had so often seen in my dream, just beyond the lawn which lay below my window. And then, once more, the fear passed so completely that I wondered what there was to fear, and I found myself, sober and quite sane, in the room in the tower, the name of which I had often heard in my dream, and the scene of which was so familiar. I looked around it with a certain sense of proprietorship oh. <laughs> and found that nothing had been changed from the dreaming nights in which I knew it so well. Just to the left of the door was the bed lengthwise along the wall with the head of it in the angle. In a line with it was the fireplace and a small bookcase opposite the door the outer wall was pierced by two lattice paned windows between which stood a dressing table while ranged along the fourth wall was the washing stand and a big cupboard my luggage had already been unpacked for the furniture of dressing and undressing lay orderly on the wash stand and toilette table toilette while my dinner clothes were spread out on the coverlet of the bed and <laughs> what then, a weird time in the world my <laughs> dinner clothes this is like fucking Downton Abbey it's like demented Downton Abbey <laughs> although I can imagine after um all of this quarantine nonsense the world returning to the idea of dinner clothes because oh, yeah. I think of like just last night yeah the the excitement of having a reason to dress to, up to dress up mm -hmm. and put on real clothes and like do your hair and makeup yeah, I, yeah. I can absolutely imagine um at least in certain circles the world returning a little bit to that once quarantine is over just because people are going to be like yeah I'm going to dress up for dinner yeah, hell yeah, absolutely. Now I'm going to dress up to go down for f fucking breakfast. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I mean, I've always been kind of that mentality. It's just like, I, I like if I have a reason to dress up, even before quarantine, I enjoyed it. It feels special. Like, that's yeah. why I still dress up when I go to the theater. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay, this is going to get right. creepy. So, my dinner clothes were spread out on the coverlet of the bed, and then, with a sudden start of unexplained dismay... I saw that there were two rather conspicuous objects which I had not seen before in my dreams. One, a life-sized oil painting of Mrs. Stone. Fuck no, absolutely not. Take it off the wall, throw it out the window. Done. Oh, God. The other, a black and white sketch of Jack Stone. Oh, my God. Representing him as he had appeared to me only a week before in the last of the series of these repeated dreams. A rather secret and evil-looking man of about thirty. His picture hung between the windows, looking straight across the room to the other portrait, which hung at the side of the bed. No! At that I looked next. And as I looked, I felt once more the horror of nightmares seize me. Oh, 
my god. At this point, I'd go down to the hostess and be like, do you have any other rooms? I'll sleep on the couch. I'll <laughs> sleep in the barn. Like, I will sleep. Can I take your car and go home, please? Like, Fuck it. I'll sleep in the car. Yeah. <laughs> like, no. Absolutely not. It represented Mrs. Stone as I had seen her last in my dreams. Old and withered and white-haired. But in spite of the evident feebleness of body, a dreadful exuberance and vitality shone through the envelope of flesh. An exuberance wholly malign, a vitality that foamed and frothed with unimaginable evil. Oh. Evil beamed from the narrow, leering eyes. It laughed in the demon-like mouth. The whole face was instinct with some secret and appalling mirth. The hands, clasped together on the knee, seemed shaking with suppressed and nameless glee. Then I saw also that it was signed in the left-hand bottom corner, and wondering who the artist could be, I looked more closely no, and read away. the inscription. Julia Stone by Julia Stone. Self-portrait? Get out of there! Go away! <laughs> oh, God! There came a tap at the door. <laughs> And John Clinton entered. Got everything you want? He asked. <laughs> Go, hello, old chap. <laughs> Rather more than I want, said I, pointing to the picture. He laughed. <laughs> Hard featured old lady, he said. By herself, too, I remember. Anyhow, she can't have flattered herself much. <laughs> but don't you see, said I, it's scarcely a human face at all. It's the face of some witch, of some devil. He looked at it more closely. Yes, it isn't very pleasant, he said. Scarcely a bedside manner, eh? Yes, I can imagine getting the nightmare if I went to sleep with that close by my bed. Uh, I'll have it taken down, yes, if you please. like. I really wish you would, I said. Yeah, get that the fuck out of my room. <laughs> he rang the bell, and with the help of a servant, we detached the picture and carried it out onto the landing and put it with its face to the wall. <laughs> She's in timeout. By Jove, the old lady is awake, said John, mopping his forehead. I wonder if she had something on her mind. The extraordinary weight of the picture had struck me, too. Oh, uh, I was about to reply when I caught sight of my own hand. There was blood on it <gasps> in considerable quantities, covering the whole palm. I've cut myself somehow, said I. John gave a little startled exclamation. Why, I have two, he said. <gasps> Simultaneously, the footman took out his handkerchief and wiped his hand with it. I saw that there was blood also on his handkerchief. Oh, my God. Ew. John and I went back into the tower room and washed the blood off. But neither on his hand nor on mine was there the slightest trace of a scratch or cut. It seemed to me that having ascertained this... We both, by a sort of tacit consent, did not allude to it again. <laughs> yeah, I don't, you don't talk about that shit. We both agreed not, not to, to say, say anything. anything without saying anything. <laughs> oh, gross. Something in my case had dimly occurred to me that I did not wish to think about. It was but a conjecture but I fancied that I knew the same thing had occurred to him. The heat and oppression from the air, for the storm we had expected was still undischarged, increased very much after dinner, and for some time most of the party, among whom were John Clinton and myself, sat outside on the path bounding the lawn where we had had tea. The night was absolutely dark, and no twinkle of star or moon ray could penetrate the 
pall of cloud that overset the sky. By degrees, our assembly thinned. The women went up to bed, men dispersed to the smoking or billiard room, men. and by eleven o'clock my host and I were the only two left. All the evening I thought that he had something on his mind, and as soon as we were alone, he spoke. The man who helped us with the picture had blood on his hand, too. Did you notice? He said. And he's like, um, dude, I thought we agreed not to talk about this. <laughs> I asked him just now if he had cut himself, and he said he supposed he had, but that he could not find any mark of it. Now where did that blood come from? By dint of telling myself that I was not going to think about it, I had succeeded <laughs> in not doing so. And I did not want, especially just at bedtime, to be reminded of it. I don't know, said I. And I don't really care, so long as the picture of Mrs. Stone is not by my bed. He got up. But it's odd, he said. <laughs> now you'll see another odd thing. A dog of his, an Irish terrier by breed, had come out of the house Puppy. as we talked. The door behind us. Oh, that dog's into gonna the start hall. barking at that. Like you know, that dogs see all this good spooky shit. <laughs> <laughs> the door behind us into the hall was open, and a bright oblong of light shone across the lawn to the iron gate, which led to the rough grass outside where the walnut tree stood. I saw that the dog had all his hackles up, bristling with rage and fright. His lips were curled back from his teeth, as if he was ready to spring at something. Yep. And he was growling to himself. He took not the slightest notice of his master or me, but stiffly and tensely walked across the grass to the iron gate. There he stood for a moment, looking through the bars and still growling. Then, of a sudden, his courage seemed to desert him. He gave one long howl and scuttled back to the house with a curious, crouching sort of movement. He does that half a dozen times a day, said John. <laughs> he sees something which he both hates and fears. I walked to the gate and looked over it. Something was moving on the grass outside. And soon, a sound which I could not instantly identify came to my ears. Then I remembered what it was. It was the purring of a cat. Oh, meow, meow. I lit a match and saw the purrer, a big blue Persian, walking round and round in a little circle just outside the gate, stepping high and ecstatically with tail carried aloft like a banner. Its eyes were bright and shining, and every now and then it put its head down and sniffed at the grass. I laughed. Kitty, meow, meow. <laughs> the end of that mystery, I'm afraid, I said. <laughs> Here's a large cat having Walpurgis. What? <laughs> Walpurgis. What's Walpurgis? Spell it. W-A-L-P-U-R-G-I-S. Walpurgis? Uh... Well, Walpurgis Night yep. is an abbreviation of St. Walpurgis Night, uh, the eve of a Christian feast day. Great. Yeah, that's what it is. Because the whole sentence is, here's a large cat having Walpurgis Night all alone. Okay, so he's Jellicle. <laughs> Jellicle cats. <laughs> he's having his, his little celebration. So he's having a solo Jellicle ball. A solo Jellicle ball. Here's a large cat having Walpurgis Night all alone. Yes, that's Darius, said John. He spends half the day and all night there. But that's not the end of the dog mystery, for Toby and he are the best of friends. Uh -oh. But the beginning of the cat mystery. What's the cat doing there? And why is Darius pleased while Toby is terror-stricken? At that moment, I remembered the rather horrible detail of my dreams when I saw through the gate just where the cat was now, the white tombstone with the sinister inscription. Yep. 
But before I could answer, the rain began. As suddenly and heavily as if a tap had been turned on. And simultaneously, the big cat squeezed through the bars of the gate and came leaping across the lawn to the house for shelter. Then it sat in the doorway, looking out eagerly into the dark. It spat and struck at John with his paw as he pushed it in, in order to close the door. Somehow, with the portrait of Julius Stone in the passage outside, the room in the tower had absolutely no alarm for me. And as I went to bed, feeling very sleepy and heavy, I had nothing more than interest for the curious incident about our bleeding hands and the conduct of the cat and dog. I would not be able to sleep. There'd be no way in hell. No way in hell. (laughs) The last thing I looked at before I put out my light was the square empty space by my bed where the portrait had been. Here the paper was of the original full tint of dark red over the rest of the walls it had faded. Then I blew out my candle and instantly fell asleep. My awaking was equally instantaneous, and I sat bolt upright in bed under the impression that some bright light had been flashed in my face, though it was now absolutely pitch dark. I knew exactly where I was, in the room which I had dreaded in dreams. But no horror that I ever felt when asleep approached the fear that now invaded and froze my brain. Immediately after, a peal of thunder crackled just above the house, but the probability that it was only a flash of lightning which awoke me gave no reassurance to my galloping heart. Something I knew was in the room with me, and instinctively I put out my right hand, which was nearest the wall, to keep it away, and my hand touched the edge of a picture frame hanging close to me. No. Oh my god, no. I sprang out of bed, upsetting the small table that stood by it, and I heard my watch, candle, and matches clatter onto the floor. But for the moment, there was no need of light, for a blinding flash leaped out of the clouds and showed me that by my bed again hung the picture of Mrs. Stone. (laughs) Hell no! And instantly the room went into blackness again. (laughs) But in that flash, I saw another thing also. Namely, a figure that leaned over the end of my bed, watching me. Oh my god! It was dressed in some close clinging white garment spotted and stained with mold, and the face was that of the portrait. Oh my god. Overhead, the thunder cracked and roared, and when it ceased and the deathly stillness succeeded, I heard the rustle of movement coming near me, and more horrible yet, perceived an odor of corruption and decay. And then a hand was laid on the side of my neck, and close beside my ear, I heard quick, taken, eager breathing. Yet I knew that this thing, though it could be perceived by touch, by smell, by eye, and by ear, was still not of this earth, but something that had passed out of the body and had power to make itself manifest. Then a voice already familiar to me, spoke. I knew you would come to the room in the tower, it said. I have been long waiting for you. At last you have come. Tonight I shall feast. Before long, we will feast together. Oh my god, oh my god, what the fuck, oh my god. And the quick breathing came closer to me. I could feel it on my neck. At that, the terror which I think had paralyzed me for the moment gave way to the wild instinct of self-preservation. I hit wildly with both arms, kicking out at the same moment, and heard a little animal squeal and something soft dropped with a thud beside me. I took a couple of steps forward, nearly tripping up over whatever it was that laid there and by the merest good luck found the handle of the door. 
In another second, I ran out on the landing and had banged the door behind me. Almost at the same moment, I heard a door open somewhere below, and John Clinton, candle in hand, came running upstairs. What is it? He said. I sleep just below you. I heard a noise as if, good heavens, there's blood on your shoulder. Oh my god. I stood there. So he told me afterwards, swaying from side to side, white as a sheet, with a mark on my shoulder, as if a hand covered with blood had been laid there. It's in there, I said, pointing. She, you know, the portrait is in there too, hanging up in the place we took it from. At that, he laughed. <laughs> my dear fellow, this is a mere nightmare, he said. He pushed by me and opened the door. I, standing there, simply inert with terror, unable to stop him, unable to move. Whew, what an awful smell, he said. Then there was silence. He had passed out of my sight behind the open door. Next moment, he came out again, as white as myself, and instantly shut it. Yes, the portrait's there, he said. <laughs> And on the floor is a thing, a thing spotted with earth, like what they bury people in. Oh. Come away, quick, come away. Oh, God. How I got downstairs, I hardly know. An awful shuddering and nausea of the spirit rather than of the flesh had seized me, and more than once he had to place my feet upon the steps while every now and then he cast glances of terror and apprehension up the stairs. But in time, we came to his dressing room on the floor below, and there I told him what I have here described. The sequel can be made short. Indeed, some of my readers have perhaps already guessed what it was, if they remember that inexplicable affair of the churchyard at West Folly some eight years ago, where an attempt was made three times to bury the body of a certain woman who had committed suicide. On each occasion, the coffin was found in the course of a few days, again protruding from the ground. After the third attempt, in order that the thing should not be talked about, the body was buried elsewhere in unconsecrated ground. Where it was buried was just outside the iron gate of the garden belonging to the house where this woman had lived. She had committed suicide in a room at the top of the tower in that house. Her name was Julia Stone. Subsequently, the body was again secretly dug up, and the coffin was found to be full of blood. Uh, um, that's it? What the fuck? That's it. What's that? <laughs> that was horrifying. Holy crap. Oh my god. That was a spooky one. I like that. That was creepy as hell. Oh my god. So like d I'm guessing she like drives people to commit suicide in that like tower maybe like or like oh shit. how oh, why oh my god so creepy oh my god ew <laughs> actually sounds to me like this is a vampire story. Yeah. Like now we feast. Yeah. Tonight I feast and soon you will feast with me. Yeah. Yeah. Like, and like, like a, that a coffin the reason, full of blood she never rested. Like the the reason the reason that the body kept coming up is because it wasn't dead. It wasn't dead. It's because she was a vampire and yeah. she kept forcing her way back out. That's what it sounds like to me. Yeah. I, clearly it's not explained, but this to me sounds like a oh, sounds like an early vampire feast. story. I was yeah. like, what? <laughs> well, and because she put her hand on his shoulder and was like breathing on his neck. Yeah. Maybe he maybe she got him. Because she touched him. Yeah, I didn't say anything about, didn't say anything about, about bite, biting but him. But, like, I don't know, maybe, like, it, early times, like, early stories, or it's, I don't know. I don't know. Ew, 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 ew. Oh, that was freaky. Yeah, that was a good one. Thank yeah. you for the recommendation. Yeah, that was crazy spooky. 
<laughs> I feel like we should have read that in like Halloween month. That, <laughs> that would have been a good one. That was super spooky. Well, that was a definitely a different tone than our Agatha Christie month. <laughs> yeah. Yep. We're taking a turn, stepping away from the mystery novels and jumping right back on the uh, the spooky story train. Ghost train. <laughs> wow. Um, yeah, that one. The room in the tower. Room in the tower. Room in the tower. I wonder how many times that was said. A bunch. It was a lot. It was like man size and marble. <laughs> yep. Which was also a very spooky, spooky story. It was also story. a creepy one, yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. That was deeply upsetting. <laughs> <laughs> it was so funny when you said uh, he had a brown mustache, because you have your mustache still um, for a couple more days. Yeah, as we're recording this, it is still November. Uh, so there there are a couple of more days of me growing up my mustache. Um, so, yes, I said yes to a proposal by a mustached man. Creepy, <laughs> dirty, mustachioed <laughs> freak. I think uh, I think tomorrow I'm gonna like I'm gonna shave everything else clean, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna try trimming the mustache into a like Errol Flynn pencil. Yeah. Just to see. Just to get if a I picture. Can, just to see if I can make that happen. Yeah. I've never been able to make a pen, uh, a pencil mustache work. I always like for whatever reason I can't I can never figure out how to trim it quite right. Yeah, I feel like it needs like like a barber or something like a, somebody who actually be, like yeah. knows how to do that because I'm assuming there's some like trimming and shaping and product involved with that probably yeah, yeah. and you also have like it probably depends on the like the kind of hair yeah it might have. or like, maybe I just need a pencil <laughs> I'll just draw it on <laughs> That's the real trick. That is. Er- Errol Flynn never had a mustache. He just had a really great set of <laughs> he just, eyeliner he pencils. Just had, he just had eyeliner over his lip. Yeah, the whole time. Tricks on you, motherfuckers. <laughs> 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 wow, well, that was fun. Uh, I, uh, I'm i not, I'm going to have nightmares tonight. Like oh, no, no nightmares. I'm going to, well, like, have creepy creepy nightmares we can we can go watch some happy christmas movies yeah we'll watch a christmas movie that'll that'll fix everything we can watch the christmas episode of the goes wrong show oh that's right we still haven't watched, we still that haven't one. watched it yeah that's great and we also have like jingle jangle to watch yep. and all it's it's holiday time yep it is as of when this comes out, December first, and which also is the last month in 2020, y'all. Woo woo, woo So keep wearing your mask, um, and uh, let's uh, get this over with. Hopefully, the vaccine is out soon, and 2020 puts a uh, end to a lot of a lot of woo wah, <laughs> whatever woo wah is. I don't know. I like it. I don't know. I think everyone knows what you mean. I I feel like Mrs. Stone is a huge part of 2020. (laughs) (laughs) We all feel like there's a creepy person like haunting us this whole time, but his name we will not mention. (laughs) Well, if you enjoyed that story and want to hear more stories like that, uh, let us know. Um, At this point, I I assume you know the drill, but just in case, you can email us at 5050artsproduction at gmail.com or shoot us a message on any of our many social media platforms. Just search for Campfire Classics and we're probably going to be the first thing to pop up. We've also got that website, campfireclassicspodcast.com. Like and subscribe if you haven't already done that. You can do that on Apple Podcasts, on Google Podcasts, on our Podbean page. Mm-hmm. Um, Leave us a review if you'd like, please. And, and most importantly, just share this episode or your favorite episode from the previous 20-something with a friend. And and this is 24. So this is 24, yeah. Yeah, share, share and, see, and, and be, our, be our own marketing team. Yeah. Uh, we good? Yeah, I think that's that everything? it. That's, that the end? that's everything. Great. Uh, thank this you very much. This is our last episode in this apartment. Probably, unless we decide to yeah. do an early recording of one. Yeah, yeah, but. All right. All right. Coming to you live from New York, <laughs> except 
taped from New York. <laughs> Live to tape from New York City. This has been Campfire Classics, where we try to read those books that look really good on your shelf. Woohoo! It's a holly jolly holiday. <laughs>